I would like to thank our sponsor of today's episode, Miller Cooper. Founded in 1919, Miller Cooper is the 11th largest accounting and consulting firm in the Chicago area. They have 335 professional staff serving middle market businesses and their owners. On a personal note, I've had the opportunity to do several transactions with the folks at Miller Cooper, and in particular, Tad Render, who leads the firm's transaction advisory services group. And they are top notch. In every transaction, they really pull their weight in more than one way, and our clients couldn't have been more satisfied with the work that they did. So I appreciate them sponsoring this episode, and if you have the need, at any time for M&A accounting and advisory services, I really highly recommend the folks at Miller Cooper. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. Looking to buy, sell, or grow your business to position it for a sale? As the owner and managing partner of Sun Acquisitions, Dominic Rinaldi has personally been involved in over 300 M&A transactions. He has seen and done it all consulting with large and small businesses across a broad range of industries. On M&A Unplugged, he'll interview buyers, sellers, and their advisors about their experiences scaling, selling, and acquiring businesses. On every episode, you will get key learnings, but most importantly, you will be better prepared for your own acquisition or sale. This is M&A Unplugged with your host, Dominic Rinaldi. There's an age-old debate. Are entrepreneurs made or born? If any of you knew my first guest, Mike McNair, you would certainly say entrepreneurs are born, for sure. I'm so excited to have Mike with me today and as the first guest on M&A Unplugged. Full disclosure to the M&A Unplugged community, Mike and I go way back to our college days as fraternity brothers. And Mike, we're going to stay away from that information today. That's a whole nother podcast. (laughs) I have lots of data points throughout the years about Mike that would produce evidence that he is a natural born entrepreneur. Even back in college, it was evident that Mike was destined to run a business, make his mark in some way, and sure enough, he did. Mike, along with his wife, Ellen, started McNair Travel in 1989 with the goal of transforming how clients approached and managed corporate travel. After growing McNair Travel to a leading corporate travel management company, Mike sold the business to an industry player, Direct Travel. For anybody who knows the travel industry, in 1989, there was no such thing as making an internet reservation. But all that changed in the mid-90s. Mike weathered that storm and many other industry changes and built an outstanding business that helped companies approach and manage travel efficiently. His company even helped coordinate travel for several presidential campaigns. Mike stayed on with the acquired direct travel under an employment agreement and is now an executive with the company. On a personal side, Mike is a force to be reckoned with. He is the author of The Secrets of Business Travel, a prolific traveler. Mike, good to know that you're uh, you're drinking your own Kool-Aid there. He's an avid outdoorsman, an Ironman. But perhaps one of the proudest moments is right ahead of him as he sees his entrepreneurial genes get passed down to the next generation. His son, Connor, is a budding entrepreneur who is building an oyster farm in North Carolina. Mike, welcome. And it must be such a blast as a successful entrepreneur to see your son building his own business. Absolutely. It's, uh, it just brought a tear to my eye. That was a great introduction. And I've, I've never heard that connection uh, said out loud, and uh, it, it it's really, uh, really warms my heart. Thanks. That was a great intro, but it is probably one of my crowning achievements to see ent- entrepreneurs thrive in the future like my sons. Yeah, you know, it's so interesting. You know, I read a couple articles recently about our entrepreneurs made or born, and, you know, you're seeing it and you're experiencing firsthand, right? I mean, those genes, they say, get passed down, so... Good luck to him as he builds his business. So, Mike, let's start with where you're at today, and then we'll work our way backwards to your business and how you built it and then how you prepared to sell it. So you sold the business uh, to direct travel. Part of the deal was you were going to stick around under an employment agreement. So I'm curious, how has the transition and the integration of McNair Travel into direct travel gone? And 
did it go the way that you had originally envisioned it when you were in negotiations and discussions and diligence with direct travel? Well, the core part of that for any entrepreneur is you want to see all your staff and customers being treated well and uh, for them to maybe not even just get the same service that you were giving them, but even better. And along those lines, it's gone extremely well. And I'm extremely happy with everything that direct travel's done to not only retain our great staff and retain our great customers, but give them some better tools and resources. And of course, that was one of the pieces of my decision to sell. The industry required a lot of technology pieces and leverage that was going to be a, a very difficult for me to obtain. And now my customers and my staff have all of these. So from that perspective, it went really well. That's great. And, and client retention, employee retention, I assume if, if that was the case, went pretty well as, as well? Yeah, absolutely. Both of those went extremely well. And, you know, as far as me and the transition within the organization, it's been a fascinating, humbling at times, frustrating at times, inspiring at times experience that actually I think is going to make me a better person, a better listener, a better leader, and maybe someone who's much more clear about what they may want to do to change the world in the future. That's great. You know, I often hear from owners that, you know, when we're talking to them about selling their businesses, they're always concerned about what's going to happen to their employees, what's going to happen to their clients after the sale. So as far as transition and integration goes, are there any key nuggets or any things that you can point to in your experience that really made for, you know, such a great outcome that you're experiencing? Well, I think great organizations have great project managers, and I think it's an under-taught skill and an under-appreciated skill in most organizations, and direct travel uh, had great project management in looking at all the elements of our organization and you know having a plan to transition all of those properly into the overall technological service set that they were putting in place for their entire organization. Direct Travel has acquired many organizations and had some practice before me, and that was one of the pieces that was attractive to me. They knew how to uh, bring a travel management company like ours on board and make it work within their system. And they weren't in a rush either. So they had an indication of how long some of these things take, uh, what to leave alone for a while. And I think uh, the decisions that we made together have produced some pretty uh, great results for them and for me. You know, Mike, that's one of the things we talk to owners about so much is being prepared for the integration. And so many companies don't have the resources or the staff to really do a proper integration. So, you know, look to the M&A Unplug community, here's number one key lesson off the bat. When you're making an acquisition, make sure you're thinking through the integration issues you know, all of the things, HR, clients, sales, marketing, you've got to have a plan for all of those things. And I would tell you, number one in the integration should be your people by far. They are the most valuable resource of a company. So if you're thinking through all those issues, you're likely to have a great outcome like Mike has experienced with his transaction. So Mike, let's go back now to the beginning. 1989, you and Ellen are sitting around and you decide you're going to open up your own business and it's going to be travel. How did you get there? And did you decide it was going to be a corporate travel business from day one or, you know, did it morph into that? Uh, it's interesting. So Ellen and I were in our mid to late twenties and, you know, my father all often says sometimes your biggest advantage is that you're young and stupid, right? So we didn't <laughs> really think through everything. We, we weren't worried about all the challenges ahead. Uh, I see my son acting the same way. I think one key element of being a successful entrepreneur is being fearless. And my son is fearless and, and we were fearless at that time. I was working for an airline. My wife is a travel agent. We had moved down to Washington, D.C. And she had a job working on one of the presidential campaigns, being the travel agent, uh, moving uh, all their staff around. And after the campaign was done, there were people who were so impressed with us. One of them took us out to dinner and casually mentioned that he'd loan us money to open up our own shop. So 
took that back to a friend of mine who was a lawyer and he said, let's draw up some papers and see if they uh, will stand behind what they said and uh, gave them some papers, uh, loaned us some money and, uh, and we acquired a small agency that literally had four desks and two people in it. But we acquired that and it was a quick jumping point to uh, having our own travel agency. And to your point about was, was I always into corporate travel? We, we kind of knew that we would always do a mix because Ellen was in the corporate travel world, but nobody really gets into the travel industry to, you know, manage the travel and expense line item for organizations uh, like I do every day now. Uh, I'm on the phone with procurement people and finance people all the time, streamlining the workflow item. And while I'm great at it, let's face it, anybody who gets in the travel industry gets into it to see the world and, and travel like a rock star. So that's always been a driver and always something that we've been involved in. But actually, the business took a turn because we were so successful in corporate travel. And it, it was always 80, 90 percent corporate travel. And, and the rest was vacation travel. So, Mike, can you remember back to the moment where you, you looked at your business and you said, wow, you know what? I think I've got something here of value. And I think this can be much bigger. And I, I actually think maybe down the road I can sell it and for, you know, a number that you're happy with. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm following all the people who are summiting Everest right now. And, you know, businesses are somewhat like that. You know, you, you have different plateaus that you hit in your business. And, and those plateaus are, are the short-term goals. And then you get there and you hover for a while and then you go further. And then you get there and you hover, hover for a while and you go further. So, in the beginning, it was really just to create a, a, a business that could pay Ellen and I about what we were getting paid and pay all of our bills. I mean, that was the, the first goal, right, is to yeah. make yeah. about that much money and have it, have it to sustain itself, be able to sustain itself. And then after that, you know, it's like, okay, well, where are we going to take this next? And I remember we were about a $10 million in sales and we were hovering. And, you know, I was scratching my head thinking, okay, what's next? And a friend of mine uh, suggested that I join him in a coaching program called the Strategic Coach. It's, it's a group of entrepreneurs that get together and talk about strategies and goal setting and, um, and, and all the related topics of growing a thriving entrepreneurial business. And I remember coming back after a couple of meetings and doing some goal setting, and I was so excited to take the business up to an, the next level. I could hardly stand it. So when I came back from the meeting, I, uh, I took over a, a little restaurant near us and I invited everybody on the staff over to the restaurant and I laid out this strategy to get us from going from 10 million to 25 million. That was going to be the goal. And I, I delivered this incredible message while everybody was eating and I couldn't have been excited. And you could hear a pin drop afterwards. I got very little <laughs> feedback from the entire staff, right? So why was that? Were they just blown away? Were they, was it just too much for them to grasp? Or was this like a new you and they didn't know where this was coming from? <laughs> you know, for some of them, they're like, there he goes again, you know, because I always had a lot, a lot of ideas. <laughs> and for some, it was like, uh, that I know right. for sure, by the way. <laughs> right. And for others, it was like, this isn't really going to impact my job. I'm going to do what I do. I'm good. And for some, yeah. there was some thinking going on. So uh, the next day, um, I came into the office and the manager, um, my manager called me in and she said, uh, Mike, hey, that was a heck of a presentation last night. And I am absolutely certain uh, that you're going to be a $25 million company one day. And I said, thanks. You know, I was wondering why nobody said anything. She goes, yeah, but you got to replace me because I can't take you to 25. <laughs> like, wow there's a wow there's a smack know? in the face by, by the way good for her for coming in. correct the most unselfish thing she could have ever done she helped me find the person that could take me up to 25 she stepped aside and actually became a travel agent for us for a while and finished up her career being a travel agent with us and um you know i i brought on, on board the guy who took us to 25 and then, you know, we got to about 35 with him and then we needed to find somebody else to take us uh, 
to 75 uh, and we, we never quite got to 75. We got to 55 and from 55 on, it's a, just a different ball game. So uh, right. that's kind of brought me to the point where uh, I had hit that plateau and uh, made a decision to sell the business. By the way, congratulations. I mean, to go from 10, even to get to 10, there are so few businesses out there that actually achieve that. And then you got it to 25 and then off to 55. I mean, that's just unbelievable. And you know, look, that employee coming to you and saying to you, I'm not the right person, really kudos to her, but also kudos to you that you created an environment where people could be honest with you at that level and and cared about you enough personally to to want to help you get to your goal. So I think it says a lot about her, but to me, it says even more about you. So uh, that's awesome. What year was it that you joined the Strat Coach? So were you 10 years in? Were you five years in? How, where were you in your maturation? Yeah, I think about 10, but I don't recall exactly. But about 10 years into my uh, operation and I think I left uh, having been in the strategic coach for about 17 or 18. Wow. Well, it, as you know, I mean, you, you're the one who turned me on the strategic coach and I'm now involved in that program and I'm early stages. So it's too soon for me to know really all the impact, but uh, watching you and a couple of other folks that we know mutually uh, go through that program, boy, that's a hell of a program. Absolutely. It is. I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm early in and you realize you start to develop these relationships and I'm only at the beginning stages, but I can only imagine after five, 10 years with the same people in the room, you know, you, you really get to a, a whole different level of communication and helping each other get to the next level. Well, being an entrepreneur is a lonely place, right? You don't have peers. You can't um, sit around and, and, and bitch about things with your peers and, you don't always know the path forward and you have to make a call and you have to be confident in it and you have to move forward. So having a group like that is therapy. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So Mike, let's start to transition into the thought of selling. So you, like most entrepreneurs, start a business so that you can maintain a certain lifestyle. And then, you know, many people get stuck there. You, you got unstuck and you, built a business that had some real infrastructure to it. Can you remember when you first started thinking, wow, I've got something here of value and maybe it's sellable. And, and how did you start to think through, you know, what you would do next to make it sellable? So that's a great question. My brother-in-law owns a very successful uh, company in California. And he was telling me about a book that he read called Finish Big. And, uh, the premise was, you know, make sure you have a plan for the dismount, you know, and I read that. And one of the steps that it mentioned was to have an idea of what your business is worth and particularly to understand, is it at peak value? Is it at the lowest point of its value? What is the value? What does that value mean to you? So, I took that to heart and I knew a lot of other uh, business owners um, in, in, the, uh, in the travel management arena. And uh, many of them had pursued me for many years to consider selling. And I went back to them and I said, what do you think my business is worth? And I was just doing this to get a better understanding of where I needed to take my business to make it worth the maximum amount of money. So hindsight being 2020, I uh, probably should have used an organization like yours to independently get a better idea for me of what my business is worth and what its strengths and weaknesses were. Because once I started talking to these people and started to do the homework that was necessary to give them some data in order to understand where my business was. I was kind of sucked into the vortex and, you know, you, you kind of get pulled in more and more as the process goes on. I am a, you know, people person, creative minded person. I was all about growth, acquisition, retention, marketing. My strength was not finance. So I had a great friend who was in the travel industry 
for many years. He had recently sold his business and that was his strength, numbers. So I asked him if he would help me do an assessment of my business and help me give the data the uh, potential buyers that was necessary. So I engaged him and he helped me with it. You mentioned the word vortex. So if I get that right, because I want to make sure that everybody that's listening understands this. So you were out on an expedition to sort of figure out what was the value of your business and what could you do to maximize it. And you were talking to industry people and they started to then engage you in discussion, acquisition discussions. That, that's what you mean by the vortex, right? Correct. And, you know, it kind of pulled me in. You know, I, I was spending more and more time doing it and it got me distracted from my business and more focused on selling it. So we're going to get to the vortex in the process, but do you think in hindsight at that point in time that you had put all of the pieces in place or most of the pieces in place that maximize the value of your business? Obviously, you know, you had a transaction, you're very happy with the transaction, but in hindsight, do you think you had put all the pieces in place to maximize the value? I did. And on top of that, I felt like the technological pieces that was going to allow me to retain those elements that were of key value to a customer were starting to crack. And if I didn't move this into an operation that had all this technological infrastructure, I would lose those resources and the uh, value of my business would drop. Got it. Got it. either that or or you'd have to probably sounds like you'd have to make some yeah. significant investment in your own business to to be able to add those those resources. Correct. The travel industry has very slim margins, and acquiring people who know both the old school technology platforms that the, a lot of the industry is still built on, and the new technologies and how to merge them is really hard. It's really difficult to find those people. And it's even more difficult to be able to afford to pay for them. So I had a few, but scaling that seemed like a very difficult task. Got it. Got it. So you're out talking to people and, you know, you just want to sort of get data points. And all of a sudden you realize, man, pe- people are interested in my business. People want to, you know, they like me. They, they <laughs> Maybe they want to buy me. So how quickly did things start to unfold for you at that point? Pretty quickly. Um, you know, it was fascinating going through the process of getting all the data together. I had learned that there were some things for me to clean up in my business, things that were uncollected, things that were uh, not being maximized, that could easily be maximized. So in the process, I was improving my business, but um, I was surprised by what the potential offers were starting to be and the interest that the organizations that I was speaking to had. And quite frankly, I you know, had been doing this for close to 30 years. I think I was ready for a change. And uh, so that was all part of it as well. Got it. So how long before you started getting, getting offers? Let's, uh, let's talk about that process. How long were you having conversations with various organizations? And and it, it was a couple of organizations that you were talking to, right? It wasn't just one potential acquirer. You were talking to several. I yeah, I was talking way. to three. There were a couple of others that I started to talk to, but I, I, I quickly eliminated those. And I was down to three pretty significantly interested parties. And I started talking to them in February. Uh, it was hot and heavy, heavy over the summer, and the deal closed at the end of October. So you were in a, what we call a dance for at least several months, I'm assuming having meetings, them learning more about your business, yep. sharing some high-level information. Mm-hmm. And this advisor that you had that was helping you through the process, he had been through it before. So how did this advisor help you think through the conversations that you were having and, and the process that you, were, that you were going through? Mostly, he helped me behind the scenes, double check all my numbers and make sure all the financial systems that we had in place that was reporting data back to these buyers were accurate. And he gave me an assessment of the strengths and weakness of those 
so I could talk to them, you know, with, with more intelligence. Uh, you know, I had my opinions on how a lot of these things were going, but, you know, his fresh opinion on what looked great, what looked okay, uh, and why was, was useful in, in having a more in-depth conversation about the financials of the business. Got it. When we run a process like that, we'll share some high level information, but we're not letting people look under the covers and, and really do a deep dive until we get offers. Did the process work that way for you as well? No, I was more engaged with the buyers throughout, signed some non disclosures pretty early, got them quite a bit of data, and we were just uh, drilling down on the data throughout that process. Got it. That probably would have been a better scenario and would have kept me a little bit more focused on my day-to-day business. I had to do a lot of this um, myself. Um, My wife, who, you know, doesn't work in the business day-to-day, hasn't for a number of years. She had to, you know, be called off the bench to help me put together a lot of things. I did have to disclose everything to my um, head of finance. And obviously, I needed data and information from him. So, uh, so the three of us were working together internally with my friend who uh, was, was helping oversee the collection of the data. Yeah. I can imagine uh, just having been through hundreds of these myself, I know the sort of process and the information that a buyer wants. And, and if you were the funnel point for all of that, uh, I imagine it was hard to keep your day job going and, and doing all of this, especially with three acquirers. How did the business operate at that point in time? Were you, were you becoming more absent from the business? Were people starting to wonder, you know, where's Mike? What's going on? You know, I, for a long time, had, you know, not been a day-to-day hands-on owner. I, I, I wasn't at the office every day. I wasn't looking over everybody's shoulders. I hired good people and empowered them to do their jobs. So we did have times and places where we got together, we met, data was reported to me, I assessed it, I made decisions based on that. And I kept all of those appointments so that, you know, everything was seemingly, you know, not not a problem. Now, I was also uh, very active in, in sales and account management, and that slowed down a little bit during that period of time. But because I was pretty much the only one doing it, me and another person, um, you know, it was really hard to tell that I had slowed that down. Got it. Got it. Well, there's another key learning for uh, the M&A Unplugged audience. You uh, built this business the right way. You were not the business. You could unplug from the business. It wasn't reliant on you. That is one of the key value drivers for any business. So there's anybody listening, there's another nugget. You want to maximize the value of your business? Don't be the business. Get yourself out of the day-to-day operations. Work on your business, not in your business. Absolutely. So Mike, let's carry on now. So you're giving them all this information. How did you get to the point where offers started to get made? Did, did you draw a line in the sand? Did somebody lead the offer process and say, we're, you know, we want to buy you and here's our number? And did the others then come in with offers? How did that all unfold? How did you bring it to a head? Uh, it started off like, okay, uh, you know, are you interested? I'm, I'm just summarizing this. There's the, are you interested phase? There's the, what information do you need from me phase? And, and that was probably the longest process, like getting everything together and getting back and forth and answering questions and uh, crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And then, you know, just naturally after that, all three parties wanted to meet to share with me what their offer was and, you know, what next steps I wanted to make. So all three were interested and they had all the data they needed. So they just uh, naturally started uh, making an offer and the negotiation ensued. And so at that point in time, so you've got three offers. What do you do now? How did you handle that? There were tangible and intangible items to evaluate, right? So there's the bottom line, uh, like whose offer is the most amount of money? And then, then kind of back to what we started off with, who's going to take best care of our people? Uh, who's going to take best care of our clients? Whose future looks 
strong. You know, you, you don't want to fold into an organization who doesn't have a, a great vision for the future. Who's going to transition well? Who is going to maybe give me an opportunity uh, to stick around for a while or even be part of the organization? Those come to mind as, as some of the bigger, the bigger items. Obviously, the timing of the payment, you know, when, when, when the money comes in, all of these things. So we kind of spreadsheeted them out and uh, evaluated them item by item. And ultimately, you know, we didn't put a score on each thing. But when you saw everything on paper and absorbed it, you got an indication of whose offer was the best fit. And so... Did you select the lead acquirer and start negotiating with just them, or did you go back to all the parties and and float counters to everybody? How did you how did you handle the next step? I kind of had A, B, C, and C. I kind of stalled a little bit. Um, I kind of slowed down flow and kind of said I was thinking about it. And one, I was aggressively pursuing, and two, I I, I was also kind of saying I'm. I'm considering between a couple of options, what can we do here? But, you know, at one point, number two, financially, you know, was quite a bit distance from number one. So, you know, I slowed down with them as well. And how long did it take you to, you know, from the time that you got the offers to get to something that all the parties could execute and move forward on? The people that I went with are professionals at this. They are excellent at acquiring uh, great travel management companies. This is the second time the leadership of this organization has done this. They did it together once, sold the bigger organization. They're doing it together here now. So um, they moved very quickly and they were very amenable to uh, some of the big things and even some of the little things like how to handle, you know, your car and some of the other things that you had run through your business and how long to stick around and what the role would be. So they were extremely flexible and extremely professional. So in hindsight, happy with the folks that came in and acquired this. And it sounds like it was a, a tremendous integration for you. So not only did you tick off all the things on your list, but your clients and your employees sounds like uh, are very well taken care of. They are. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So Mike, now look back the whole picture, you know, the entire process running your company and getting to the point where, you know, most entrepreneurs dream of, you know, uh, sell their business for a number that they're happy with and, you know, move on to the, to the next stage. What, key advice would you offer to other entrepreneurs that are, you know, hoping to build their businesses up, maximize the value, and then, you know, have a sale at some point in time? Well, I do believe you really need to have a a handle on what your business is worth and what makes it worth that much and what's holding it back from being at its maximum value. So, um, where this all started, I don't regret poking around to try to find what what that those numbers were. In hindsight, I would have picked a third party who would help me come up with that information so that I could have paused and looked at it independently without di- directly engaging in, in buyers and having a better understanding of that to determine next steps. I'm not going to look say I'm, I would look back and I, I don't regret selling at all. But um, if somebody was asking me for the best practice, I would say that would have been a better practice because, you know, you can go either way. You could sell it or you could not sell it. You could grow it a little bit more. I would have had to go on through, you know, an employee revolution and technology revolution. And, you know, I just, you know, had done that a number of times and wasn't ready to do it. But others, you know, they're in a different situation. So I, rec- I, I recommend that uh, a great deal. Really knowing what you want, uh, you know, in, in, in money is the start. And then after that, what are all the other goals of this sale? Like under, understanding those objectives are, are really important. You know, do you want to stick around? Do you not want to stick around? around? Do you want to run out the door immediately? Do you want to stick around for a while and make sure everything is transitioned properly and, and then determine what to do? You know, making sure you understand all of that is really important. 
And getting the assistance to get all this information together is extremely important as well. I chose to stick around. Um, I'll be on my third year, finishing up my third year at the end of October this year. And I think I was mentioning this to you, Dom, in one of our, you know, one of our cocktail hours that I really at times say out loud, I wish I knew what I wanted to do afterwards. But at the same time, when I evaluate where what the thought process I have been in over the last three years, the fact that I can work and contribute in this organization while I'm thinking and deciding if I want to just continue this forever or if I want to do other things, what my passion is, how much time do I want to work, um, how I want to save the world, um, you know, really kind of evaluate all of that is, is, has been really useful. And even if I said when I was selling, I'm going to do this next, I don't know if three years later it would be the same thing. So, um, it's been a great opportunity to be able to reflect, uh, and contribute, but at the same time, learn from being in a bigger organization too. I've learned a lot over the last couple of years and I've contributed a great deal. You know, I'm basically, you know, doing sales and, and some, uh, account management slash retention in the, um, greater Washington area. You know, I was the number one salesperson in the company last year. So okay. that felt good. And again, I couldn't have done it without my background, but again, I couldn't have done it without the tools and, and some of the, new learnings that I've had over the last couple of years either. So I'm grateful and you need a little time. Yeah. You know, you just threw out two more absolute nuggets that I talk about all the time to my clients is know the value of your business and know what drives the value of that business. So Mm -hmm. you know where the levers are. And then the other one is, what are you going to do next? I'll talk to prospective clients all the time. And I'll ask them that question. So what are your plans? You maybe want to sell the business, but what are you going to do next? And I'm always concerned when the client doesn't have the next thing they're going to go do. And uh, that worries me, uh, I, you know, because you don't want to hear that, uh, you know, a seller had remorse that they sold the business. They might have been completely happy with the number they got for the business, but now they, they don't really know what's next. And so those are two really key nuggets. Mike, that was awesome information. And, you know, again, congratulations on, you know, building an incredible business and then being able to realize all that hard work through the, through the sale. Hey, and uh, last question for the audience, best business book that you've ever read and, and why? You know, really curious to hear what really stuck with you. Hmm. I guess I'm a little ADD on that. I've read so many um, I was really passionate about the Good to Great series uh, at that period of time. It just hit me uh, at a time when I was trying to make my company, take my company from good to great. Uh, and it's fascinating how a lot of those companies have gone out of business already. But the concepts I still believe in are, are super strong. That one jumps out of my mind. And, uh, uh, and, and just to kind of tie it into where, where I am at this period of my life, uh, I just read Wisdom at Work by uh, Chip Connolly, uh, which is a great book for people, you know, at this kind of phase, stage, age uh, in their careers. So uh, I've read many, but those two hit me like right at the right time and jump out. Yeah, Chip Connolly, very successful entrepreneur out in Silicon Valley, built uh, the hotel chain Joie de Vivre and has done many other things. So I got to read that. I'm adding that to my list. Mike, really appreciate you being here today, and you stuck with me. You're uh, you're in the midst of maybe being a grandfather. I understand <laughs> that uh, your son and daughter-in-law just uh, maybe might be getting to the point of uh, getting the baby out, and so um, I appreciate you sticking with us today. If for folks who want to reach you for corporate travel needs, how can they get a hold of you? I'm going to give my email, my personal email address. Uh, because I, at this point in my life, I'm all about helping people. So if I can help you connect on corporate travel, if I can help you on vacation travel, or if I can answer any of your questions related to anything that I spoke about today, um, may not 
be able to answer it or do an in-depth project about it, but I surely can connect you with somebody who can. Um, my email address is mike.macnair, M-A-C-N-A-I-R at gmail.com. All right, Mike, thank you so much for being with us today. And really my honor to have you as my first guest on m a Unplugged and can't wait to see you next. I'm honored and literally you brought a tear to my eye with the introduction. And um, Dom, you're an amazing person and you have an amazing business. Thank you very much. Thanks, brother. So uh, M&A Unplugged community, you got four really key nuggets today. One was integration, how important it is to plan for and be ready for the integration of a business, whether you're selling it or you're buying one, thinking through how that would happen is so critical. The other nugget was as an owner to not be the business. If you find yourself in a position where you're the key salesperson, where you're driving the needle, where people have to come through you to get stuff done, you're not building a valuable business. The next is understanding the value of your business and what drives the value of your business. And and what drives it might even be more important because then you'll know and understand the levers that you can push and pull to increase the value as you move forward. And then the last, if you're the owner of a business, thinking through what is the next phase. And even if you're an acquirer of a business, you really want to know what that owner plans to do next so that this is a good transaction for everybody. Those were great nuggets from Mike McNair and really enjoyed having him on. All of today's information will be available in the show notes. If you would like to learn more about the process of acquiring or selling a business, please visit our website at sunacquisitions.com or feel free to reach out to me at drinaldi at sunacquisitions.com. I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of the M&A Unplugged podcast. And until then, please remember that scaling, acquiring, or selling a business takes time, preparation, and the proper knowledge. Thank you for joining us today on M&A Unplugged. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and recommend it wherever you get your podcasts. If you want more great information on how to scale, acquire, or sell a business, please visit our website at sunacquisitions.com.